Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Sugar Free Show with myself, Karen Thompson, and nutritionist Emily McGuire. Today, we are so excited to have the wonderful, amazing, fabulous um, Dr. Jeffrey Gerber with us. Now, I first met Dr. Gerber when he came to Cape Town to speak at the Low Carb High Fat Summit um, that we had here last year, and he really is not only an amazing doctor, but a really, really nice person as well. So we're very honored to have him here. Um, Dr. Gerber is a board-certified family physician and owner of South Suburban Family Medicine in Littleton, Colorado, where he is known as Denver's Diet Doctor. He has been providing personalized health care to the local community since 1993 and continues that tradition with an emphasis on longevity, wellness, and prevention. Nutrition and its effects on health are areas of interest for Dr. Gerber. Frustrated with spiraling healthcare costs related to the treatment of conditions like overweight, obesity, diabetes, and heart disease, just to name a few, Dr. Gerber has been focusing on prevention and treatment programs using LCHF. So welcome, Dr. Gerber. We are so happy to have you with us. Oh, thanks, Karen and Emily, for having me. It's so great to be back together with two of my favorite international <laughs> real food addicts. Yay! You and have to do that. <laughs> yeah. So, Jeff, just to kind of launch into it, and we kind of ask everyone this, but I find this particularly of interest to ask the health professionals, particularly doctors, obviously, and MDs, how did you even not only get into kind of looking at nutrition as kind of an approach for helping patients, but how did you even get into sort of the LCHF approach? Kind of where did it all start from? Sure. Well, I, I always go back 16 years, maybe to the year 2000. And uh, I'm a traditionally trained doctor. That goes back 25 years, 26 years now. And uh, honestly didn't know a whole lot about nutrition. Uh, and then I was just doing my doctoring thing, as most of us do, so busy working and doing everything that we were taught to do, not really having time to question it. And uh, just a sense of frustration around, you know, 15, 16 years ago that we're just pushing pills, uh, uh, recommending therapies for our patients, and just putting band-aids on um, problems, specifically chronic disease such as obesity, diabetes, prediabetes, cardiovascular disease, aging, all these uh, chronic diseases in, in modern society that uh, we weren't really getting at the root cause. And what's interesting is that I'm a primary care doctor. And, we, you know, in, in, in the UK, we, we call them GPs. Here we call them family doctors or internists or pediatricians or, or gynecologists or kind of the primary care doctors. And we're the gatekeeper. And they talked to us for years about prevention. And I said, well, yeah, that's a grand idea. But they really didn't have much to say beyond that in terms of nutrition advice. And we found that... Uh, you know, the traditional nutrition advice is basically eat less, exercise more, cut calories, cut fat, just wasn't a long-term solution. And then um, around this time, uh, patients start to, started to approach me with uh, different ideas about diet. I had some personal experience with the low-carb diet, uh, family members, and uh, Originally, originally, I was skeptical, and you know, again, back in the year 2000, and uh, I did say to people, "Okay, well, look, we'll follow your metabolic markers." And to my surprise, back then, uh, their metabolic markers improved, such as uh, blood sugar, their insulin, their lipid profiles, their inflammatory markers. And you know, it's been 16 years, and you know, back then I had patients that learned with me, mm -hmm. and I had diabetics who, you know, we got to, to lose weight. I, I think over the years we've helped a lot of uh, patients in, improve um, and, and reverse some of these chronic diseases, prevent chronic diseases, prevent heart attacks. And, uh, you know, I've been at it for so long. It's just exciting to see things change over this the 16 years. I mean, it's, it's now uh, just uh, an international um, uh, event that... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, all over the world, um, we're connecting and, and realizing that there's science out there supporting um, 
the redefinition of uh, better nutrition. Mm -hmm. And I think just to kind of go on from that, I mean, you've been doing it now for 16 years, and I think a lot of people are still relatively quite new to even to this concept. So that must have been quite challenging back way back when when you were kind of getting into it. So how did you? I mean, was it someone? advice in particular that you followed or kind of what, how did you even learn what low carb was? It, it was a bit frightening and a bit challenging back then because I, I was all by myself and uh, you know the inter internet wasn't much of a happening back then but I, I did my studies and I started, I started reading books, I started looking at the, the, the medical literature um, and I became very fascinated in uh, the metabolic syndrome. I think that was one of the guiding principles. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Jerry Raven back in 1988 uh, was uh, made headlines for um, Sir Frederick Banting lecture, which is the he's the he's the uh, the other Banting who invented mm -hmm. insulin. So you know he had a famous lecture series where he talked about the metabolic syndrome and really what it did was bring together this idea that uh, diabetes, hyperinsulinism, heart disease, hypertension, all these were related in a common theme of, of inflammation, insulin, oxidative stress, and it, it really all gelled together and, and there were mechanisms that, that were demonstrated and proven and the way to approach these chronic diseases was through nutrition. I really did never see metabolic syndrome as as a as a, something that was approached with medication. Now, some people say, "Well, there was metformin," you know, that that was around. Well, well okay, but uh, and it's not a terrible medication. But when you look at the root cause and and the mechanisms, it's really a, a nutritional. Uh, condition a nutritional syndrome and you think about the macronutrients that that drive the metabolic syndrome and you start thinking about um, carbohydrates as the as the first culprit then protein and then f fats natural fats which are metabolically neutral mm -hmm. and, just uh, to take it one step um, back a little bit, Jeff, just for people listening, can you explain what the metabolic syndrome actually is and then why does you know LCHF in particular kind of help out, which I think where you were going, but I think that would be quite interesting for a lot of people to know. Sure. So Jerry Raven had um, done, done actually um, uh, research on, on a new test. It was actually what he called um, um, it's glucose dependent insulin uptake was his test uh, and that's what he focused on um, and uh, to discover the metabolic syndrome which was insulin resistance so the main mechanism of this was insulin resistance that that insulin is is there to normally signal the body that fuel is available as energy and the cells uh, respond to insulin via insulin receptors and then the cells open up channels to basically take in energy and over time as we say as we become more insulin resistant we actually gain more weight um, we have more adipose tissue these cells become resistant to this in insulin signal among many other things insulin isn't the only metabolic defect here and then the insulin doesn't work properly. You have to produce more insulin to take in the energy, and so that's that's kind of describing what the insulin resistance is. And there's other components to it. One is hyperinsulinism, hyperinsulinemia, um, which is a condition really described by Dr. Joseph Kraft, and we we've inter we interviewed him last year, and he's just a fascinating gentleman who now is alive and in his 90s, and it's part of this metabolic syndrome. Maybe it help, ha happens a little bit upstream. So you have hyperinsulinemia, hyperinsulinism. You have insulin resistance. You have hypertension. And the other component is what uh, Raven actually called atherogenic dyslipidemia, 
And what he really was starting to discuss back then was that there was a, a problem perhaps of the quality of the cholesterol, not necessarily the quantity. And we really like to talk about it that way. He may have not used that word, but he was starting to talk about the ratios of triglyceride to HDL, not necessarily total cholesterol or uh, total LDL concentration. And nowadays, this was after the time of Raven, now we're talking about cholesterol quality looking at particles. But mm -hmm. still brings us back to the same idea that we're looking at uh, the quality of cholesterol uh, rather than the quantity. And so the quality really def defines inflammation, oxidative stress, something called AGEs, which is um, advanced glycation and end products. And that's what metabolic syndrome defines. And if you want to reverse it, you approach it with the proper fuel. So you reduce carbohydrates. It's a low, you know, it's low carb. It's I like to call it a low protein diet. And um, again, when you look at the mechanisms, the the fats, the natural fats, are metabolically neutral. And so if you increase natural fats in the diet, you're basically addressing metabolic syndrome. It all makes sense. And there's evidence now to show that low carb diets help people to, to treat reverse metabolic syndrome, to help with weight loss. So it all, it all fits. What we really need, however, are outcome studies looking at long term things like heart attack, stroke, death. Mm -hmm. And hopefully those will be coming in the next couple years. But I think today we have some fairly good observational and associational studies that show perhaps a strong association between this proper diet addressing metabolic syndrome and heart disease. And um, what did way. you, sorry, sorry Jeff, let me to interrupt you there. Um, taking it and looking at the cholesterol aspect, and I know that's obviously, you give a really amazing presentation and that was the one you did in South Africa, but mm. Cholesterol for a lot of people is what gets people concerned with low carb, high fat because we have this belief that you know too much fat raises cholesterol, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, how do you kind of deal with your patients in in that sense? How do you talk to people around why that doesn't impact or why low carb actually can have a better outcome on your cholesterol profile? Right. So. That's the million dollar question and that's why I've taken a great interest in addressing cardiovascular risk because if that wasn't an issue then everyone would be, be doing low carb and traditionally the concern and it really dates back to the days of Atkins that if you put people on a, a higher in saturated fat diet that their, their cholesterol goes up and in general you know, that's true, and I break it into perhaps thirds that maybe a third of the patient, we see their, their lipoproteins go up. And the concerning markers, the total cholesterol and the, um, the LDL cholesterol. And guess what? Now we do advanced testing. Sometimes we even see the particle count go up. You know, the LDLP, we, we, see, we see that even go up. And so the, the question is, is that bad? And so over the last couple of years, I decided, you know, I'm kind of of the age, I'm in my 50s now. I'm concerned about my longevity, my wellness, my cardiovascular risk. So call it selfish, but I did my studies to try to make some sense out of it. And, you know, again, referring to something I mentioned before is that when you look at cardiovascular risk in terms of inflammation and oxidative stress, which is, which is new technology, which is, which is new science, it, it really changes your whole perspective. And we now look at the, the quality of the, uh, the cholesterol, which, which is actually just associative. And that's another important point is that lipoprotein is associative. Um, mm -hmm. And it's it really, you know, all the studies, it, it, it's not even strongly associated, if you ask me. You know, some of the studies uh, to actually um, have a dietary intervention where you decrease saturated fat in the diet and replace it with, say, vegetable oils. Well, 
those studies never showed that it uh, reduced cardiovascular risk. In fact, in the last couple of years, there's a, a group from the NIH that actually looked at two uh, older studies. One was the, the Sydney Heart Protection Study, and also recently, this was the, uh, the MCE, the Minnesota Coronary Expo uh, Experiment. And in both those studies, they demonstrated that um, not only was there data that was kind of buried for years, but they uncovered the data and showed that uh, the intervention replacing saturated fat with vegetable oils, now they did specify that it was the omega-6 uh, vegetable oil, actually caused more people to die. So that experiment didn't really, so we haven't had any experiments really showing that uh, reducing saturated fat helps. Then you look at the, uh, the studies uh, on medications such as statins, and for primary prevention, that is uh, giving um, statins to healthy people that don't have heart disease, it only reduces their uh, chance of having a, an absolute uh, an absolute risk reduction of having a heart attack by one percent over five years is is very very tiny, and so, you know, so what do we do with these patients where they're they go on a low carb diet and we see a rise in lipoprotein? Well, you have to understand that the particles or the LDL cholesterol they're just one marker of many markers, and so we have to look at the whole picture. We have to see what is the status with uh, insulin. Look at inflammatory markers um, to see what else is going on with the patient. What kind, you know, are they uh, adhering to a low-carb, high-fat diet? And are the ratios favorable? And we can look at particle size. Now some people say, well, if it's all large particles, you have nothing to worry about. But again, all this stuff is associational, so perhaps that's favorable you know it's good that you see all these markers in a favorable way so you just have to look look at the big picture and we have people in the low carb community that say well you know maybe that's a bad thing we don't have all the answers yet and uh, it's a, it's still a hot topic mm -hmm. and you know I haven't drawn any conclusions other mm -hmm. than saying we could put all the metabolic markers aside and look at cardiovascular imaging which I'm very fond of in particular, the calcium score. Uh, and, okay. Yeah, and I actually got involved with this through my engineering problem-solving friend Ivor Cummins. Yeah. Uh, from Dublin, and um, <laughs> our involvement with the Widowmaker movie, which mm -hmm. is a story of uh, of calcium score and and the benefit. And basically, if you want to do risk assessment in terms of cardiovascular disease. Uh, the calcium score trumps them all because you're actually looking at subclinical cardiovascular disease. Forget about this marker, forget about that marker. And so, you know, if you have a, a, a perfect calcium score of, say, zero, and what it's doing is it's measuring calcium in the tiny coronary arteries using a high speed CAT scan machine. And so, as plaque develops first soft and then it begins to harden, we see calcium build up, so at, you you can really basically quant, quantitate the the amount of calcium that you see in this um, in the scan, and um, you know you can see numbers zero is a perfect score, and and then it can go into the thousands, and so your risk increases, and more importantly is progression of plaque, so you can do a calcium score every two to three years, and if your plaque progresses or the calcium progresses at more than 15 percent a year um, your, your mortality drops and so the goal is to stabilize calcium and so I think in in the 21st century we have to really move beyond um, standard lipid profiles maybe advanced testing can you know advanced testing has actually been shown on a traditional diet to predict risk better than standard lipid testing but I just think lipid testing is old technology. It, you know, it dates back to the, uh, you know, the f 40s and 50s, and we've been measuring it in our office since the 70s. Yeah. Do, you, do you think that would actually come, though? I mean, even when you look at the, uh, the nutrition advice that's given now as well, when we look at the policy, do you think that we're actually getting to a place now where testing or and even looking at policy in general is 
is even going to change? Do you think the tide is turning at all? Yeah, lip lipid testing is going to be around for a long, long time. <laughs> yeah, it, it's got it's going to go away. In fact, uh, I was having a discussion. I have a cardiologist down the street that is uh, actually very fond of low carb. And Yay! I didn't say. <laughs> yeah. So he's low carb, but he kind of has a more traditional view when it comes to cholesterol. He says low carbs great including the high fat, but if, if you see a rise in your particles, well, then he's got a problem, you know, and then he recommends medication or to cut back on saturated fat. But the, the conversation was interesting talking about the, uh, it was the 2013 uh, gu guidelines in the U.S. that had come out, and um, there were many who were trying to push advanced testing as being part of that, and just basically politics. They were looking at money and advanced testing and basically came to the conclusion that no, we're not going to recommend any advanced lipid testing. We're going to stick with standard lipid testing but bring in the concept of measuring the non-HDL uh, cholesterol which is, um, you know, basically it's the total it's the co total cholesterol minus HDL and we're going to use that as a marker which is maybe not so bad but um, I think there's a lot of resistance to some of the advanced testing out there. But believe it or not, calcium score w um, was uh, not part of um, the, the recommendations for years, but in 2013 they have a soft recommendation, and we think it's a great test. So mm. we're going to be doing lipids for a long time. Are these tests um, quite accessible in the States? Are they... I mean, I know over in the UK it's very difficult to get tests in like that, particularly on our NHS system, and even to get, you know, particle testing done is, you know, not heard of really at all. So, is it quite accessible for you guys in the state? Well, um, advanced testing is everywhere. The ins I find that most insurance companies still aren't paying for advanced lipid testing. You know, the NMR. Uh, we, you know, we have a NMR. We have uh, Boston Heart Diagnostic, uh, Berkeley is another one, HDL is a company that went out of business for <laughs> unfair uh, business practices actually, um, <laughs> we don't go into it. And then, and then the advanced uh, imaging, the calcium score um, is available in, um, in Europe. I, I, I don't know about um, South Africa, Karen, do you know if there's any, oh I talked to your mother about that actually Aww. last year. Oh, yeah, oh, that was, last year. I love that was one of my favorite conversations. Jeff, you literally do know everybody. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, we have a question here though, following on from your protein um, comment about going really low. Um, Caroline says, how low can you go with protein? Right, so you know in general the it depends on how large or small a person you are, but uh, you know protein intake could be 60 to 100 grams uh, per day, and I just um, I like to say low. You know, moderate might be a better word, but just to emphasize that you know fat is the you know is the yeah. macronutrient that we really want to focus on. Um, and liberalize, especially if you have um, an insulin problem, you know, diabetes, even even heart disease. Mm -hmm. And not to mention, Dr. Kraft, um, through his, you know, um, what, 35 years of research and having done 16,000 insulin assays, um, That's a lot. concluded that, uh, you know, in his population, 83% of the patients failed the insulin assay. Now some people say that you know he picked people that would fail. Well that could be true but if you now apply his insulin assay to some recent NHANE studies that have been mm -hmm. done in the state here, I mean just easily we can predict that 75 percent of the people in these NHANE studies would fail the Kraft assay and the NHANE studies are now saying that you know uh, over half of the US population are diabetic or pre-diabetic and that's without even doing the insulin assay. So, you know, this diet is just critical and important. And mm -hmm. I, th 
figured it out 16 years ago, and I am just so excited to be here talking to you guys. I didn't know you guys, and just I feel that my job is to educate everybody, but specifically healthcare professionals, mm -hmm. and re-educate. And you know, I, I we mentioned before the call that um, I, I'm so involved with the conferences that um, I, I work on getting educational credits here in the state for these conferences trying to entice healthcare professionals um, you know both in in the low carb community and out of the low outside of the low carb community to be part of this and mm -hmm. to, to learn and to challenge and what do you think the challenges are with the healthcare professionals what do you think it's going to take to kind of get them on board Right, so it's so unorthodox. They call it, you know, Steve Finney likes to call himself a heretic, and I think that's an that's an appropriate uh, appropriate term. So, you know, I like to gentle the blow. I mean, I like to create peace rather than controversy. Now, not you're everybody. You're the nicest one out of the whole group, Jeff. <laughs> I'm the what? You're the, peace, you're the peacemaker. The whole group. At least, at least I try. <laughs> And I don't know that I'm always successful, but I like to try to find common themes that people can agree upon. So, you know, what's wrong with the notion that people should eat real food, that they should eat unprocessed food, that they should cut out sugar? I mean, you guys know all about that. I mean, yeah, I mean, sugar's the first, the first to go. And and then just ease in the concept of you know reducing carbohydrates in the diet you know moderate protein and then just to talk about you know natural fats that you know the, the message is it has been mixed for all these years and you know that monounsaturated fats are probably just as healthy as saturated fat and we should be avoiding the polyunsaturated fats the industrial vegetable oils that are easily prone to oxidative stress and inflammation you know, and I want my lipoproteins in my bloodstream to be full of mono and saturated fats. I mean, the only polyunsaturated fats in there are the fish oils. You know, mm -hmm. the EPA, probably DHA is probably a better a better choice. But we need to go go lightly on mm -hmm. polyunsaturated fats. Mm -hmm. So I healthy lipoproteins to stay that way. <laughs> and just to take it to just the, the bigger picture with the healthcare professionals, you obviously hosted Low Carb Veil vale quite recently, which I was very jealous to uh, not be there. Me so, too! <laughs> so what else is kind of coming up? Is there kind of a, a push now for more conferences, education days, kind of what is it starting to look like now on the horizon with all that kind of front, particularly the CME kind of front as well? Right. So, um, you know, Rod Taylor in Australia has been doing low carb down under real quietly for a couple years. And I'm looking forward to attending one of those conferences in September. And then I think um, the low carb summit really put conferences on the international map, Karin. I mean, that was your effort. <laughs> you go, girl. Yay! But you all came. And, and then it. It got, I think it got people thinking, well, geez, you know, we should have a conference here, a conference there. There's nothing really in the States. Um, we had a relationship with the uh, uh, Obesity Medicine Association where Nutrition and Metabolism Society um, jointly held a conference, and Nutrition and Metabolism Society is Richard Feynman. And so that relationship, I think, kind of ended this year, and it really opened it up in the, in the United States for conferences. And so Rod Taylor and I, or I should say Rod convinced me to, to have a conference in Vail because we like to ski there. So we did that, and then, you know, now we have, there was a great conference in, um, in Tampa with Dom mm -hmm. D'Agostino, that was in uh, the end of January. Then we had Vale. Now we have Food Loose coming up in Reykjavik, Iceland. I'd love yes! to be at that one. Where are you going? No, I. <laughs> I'd love to go, but. Oh, me I, too. I have, to, I have to work, sometimes. Let's just go. Come, let's just go. Let's really, all really go. Really yeah, let's go. It would be fun. Yes. Really, really. 
So, well, we can and talk then, about And then there's and also... Then, yeah, the, the Low Carb USA is coming up in, in San Diego in July, and I think uh, you guys are, are attending that. I don't know. <laughs> I'm yeah. still on, on the cusp. Of, I'm not sure if I'm 100% going, but I want to. It's very but exciting. I think you should. Uh, I, let me tell you, so I, I volunteered. Doug Reynolds is really passionate. He happens to be South African, Karen, by the way. I know! Yeah. How about uh -huh. that? And uh, I volunteered to work on the educational credits for the healthcare professionals. And uh, it, ta it's a, it takes a bit of work. <laughs> and we're going to finally, I have to um, gather abstracts to present to the, uh, the committee. The, it's the American Academy of Family Physicians. And, you know, they're looking for um, really scientific content, I think, is the main thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you, um, you can refer to books, but there has to be some science in there. Um, and... And if it meets certain criteria, it's accepted. I know that, you know, it was a political battle when you in South Africa uh, had to work on the credits for the Low Carb Summit. So I hope it doesn't turn into a political battle here, but so far, but it is a great lineup of speakers. I mean, yes. there's 20 talks that will have the potential for educational credits, and there's a probably another six or seven on top of that. And I, the room can hold 900 people, so I mean, I don't it's going to be fun. Any as possible. Yeah, it's going to be really, really fun. I mean, there's Chase and Fung, there's Dr. Michael Eads, there's Gary Tubbs, um, Dom D'Agostino, Jeff Bolick, um, Angela Puff, uh, Jackie Eberstein. Francisca Spritzer, Andres Insult, Eric Westman, Iva Cummins. Now, I want to know, are you writing a book? Yes. I'm, I'm helping. No, so. Oh. Yeah, so, so actually, Ivor and I are going to give a talk at uh, in San Diego together. Yeah! Oh, and, so Ivor and I met several years ago. He gave a, a, a cardiovascular presentation called the Cholesterol conundrum yeah, and I gave yeah. my presentation cholesterol OMG and we found each other you know online and and the content was exact the same and oh. you know you know I'm the doctor version of him and he's the engineering version of me and so I mean bromance at its absolute fair <laughs> call it a bromance I apologize <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it, it, you guys have a proper bromance going on. Car and I have been witness I mean, to it in the same you room. Really <laughs> yeah, so I mean, it's the same passion, and so Ivor, out of um, this movie, The Widowmaker, um, he developed a, a relationship with with the um, the businessman in in Ireland that uh, basically produced and funded the movie, and approached him to write write the sequel as a book. And, wow. of course, you know, when I heard about this, I said, boy, I would love to, you know, assist and help out. And, um, you know, it's an arduous pro uh, process. Ivor's written the book uh, twice over now, maybe three times over. But mm. we're at the point now, we actually work with Dr. Michael Eads to connect us with, uh, with um, the right people. And it starts with finding um, a book agent and an editor, and we finally found them. And now what we're doing is we're working on, um, you know, uh, the, the the pitch to the the publishers. And so it's a fifty doc, fifty page document that basically oh. here's the question: Okay, what's the book about? Why is this different? What's new? You know, why are you the the perfect authors for it and what's it you know what's in the book what, what are the details and so that's we're, we're working on the pitch right now and you know the goal is we'd like to find a large publisher because the businessman back in Ireland you know, wants it to be big so and it and the book talks about basically you know uh, chronic disease and solving um, root cause from an engineering perspective, which is where Ivor comes from. 
Amazing. So it's really an engineering perspective looking at chronic disease and what we got wrong and you know how we can change um, lifestyle and diet to uh, address all these issues. So that's it. <laughs> that's fantastic. And who else is uh, doing some amazing things that we can support to you know to specifically change the way that the medical professionals are viewing this lifestyle change? So that you guys can support. Yes. Who else is oh. doing some great stuff in your space? Yes. So, you know, I'm so excited. In the, la in the last two years, I'm connecting with so many healthcare professionals that are involved, you know, and, and just they were basically doing their own thing and they all came together. So mm -hmm. I wish I had the list in front of me, but, you know, Sarah Halberg is involved mm -hmm. with the Nutrition Coalition. And that's that's an effort with Nina Teicholtz. I think Gary yeah. Cobbs is involved with that a little bit. Mark Kukazella, Robert O. Uh, there's there's doctors. Uh, the list just uh, Dr. Eads, uh, Eid, Eid. This is another Eid. The list goes on and on. I'm involved in the group um, Physicians for Ancestral Health, mm -hmm. and yeah, we're we're we want to basically, you know, uh, get involved with healthcare professionals. We want to get involved on the political side. I mean, we'd like to go to Capitol Hill and have a conversation with the food policy makers and get our foot in the door. Um, that would be fun. Yeah, I mean, there, and what what I like, you know, is there's a lot of these primary care doctors. I mean, the effort, is, it's family doctors and internists. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're the leaders here. You know, yep. it's not the cardiologist. It's not the endocrinologist. It's, the, it's us you know, we're in the trenches trying mm -hmm. to address prevention and we're the ones that's, that want to have this dialogue. So that's just absolutely exciting. Um, I, I'm, I'm a board member of the, the HEAL clinics with Dr. Westman. Oh, amazing. HEAL stands for healthier eating and living and, you know, um, Dr. Westman had the same idea that I had several years back that wouldn't it be grand if we could open um, clinics all over the country that uh, use food to treat chronic disease. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're just getting started but um, we're gaining momentum. We found some young doctors, great doctors actually in, um, in San Francisco uh, oh, hey. Shecker and Carlos, like yeah, that we met yeah. at the conference, and um, they want to basically uh, help us manage and run and open heal clinics in, in California where they they currently live. Wow! So that's really exciting. I, it's really exciting. So I think that um, this is bigger than any single person, and. Uh, you know, people want to make names for themselves, but I think it's time that we all come together. There really oh, is a momentum. Yes. yes. Absolutely. There's so much more power when we stand together than when we stand alone. I'm with you. Yeah. I mean, j I, what you guys are doing, I mean, all, we all need to just um, do everything we can to, um, to, to educate uh, the world about um, better nutrition. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I think we're coming to the end of the program, sadly, and we always finish off by saying, I'm asking you, what are your top three tips for sugar-free living? Uh, uh, throw away processed food. Yay! Um, don't eat sugar. Beautiful. <laughs> Including sugar-sweetened beverages. Uh-huh. And don't fear fat. Ooh, I like that one. I like that last That's one. Great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. I am just displaying where you can find Dr. Jeffrey Gerber. He is on Facebook. He's on Twitter. He's on his website. Um, he's also known as Denver's Diet Doctor. He is a pioneer in this movement. I mean, you've heard from the interview. He has been doing this since, I mean, I wasn't even born yet, probably. No, I'm just kidding. 
<laughs> this evening. <laughs> so you can join us in San Diego at lowcarbusa.org. That's lowcarbusa.org. Also, tell us about the low carb veil videos quickly before we finish up, if you don't mind. Where can we find those? Yes, so um, you can find them in two locations, and uh, they're not all up, but uh, you can go to Low Carb Down Under. They have a YouTube page, and also um, at dietdoctor.com, Dr. Einfeld has them currently going through uh, the membership website, but uh, they're just a wonderful production and, and very educational. I'm still listening to them. I'm trying to go through them myself. Because I was too busy running the conference to listen. Tell me about it. It's quite a job, yes. huh? Yes. I, I'm learning. I'm learning. Uh, but thank you so much for all you do, Jeff, and for coming on and just being a part of um, this little change that Emily and I are also trying to make. So we really, really appreciate that. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Thank okay. you. Bye. Bye, guys. Bye.